All right, fabulous. Again, my name is Andrea Malcolm. I am director of Historic Denver's Molly Brown House Museum located in Denver, Colorado. Tonight you are joining us for one of uh, several in a speaker series we're doing this summer called A Deeper Dive. We are taking a look at the Titanic in new ways. Um, and this uh, today we're focusing on the Swedish and Syrian passengers. Um, some notes of housekeeping, we'd ask that everyone keep themselves on mute. Um, you do have the chat available to you to drop in questions. Um, we will have some time for Q&A after each presenter and then at the end. Um, and so um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to just launch a quick poll so we can see where everyone is joining us this evening. So you should see a poll pop up. Uh, where you can tell us if you're coming from one of the local counties or if you're coming from elsewhere in Colorado, the United States, or if you're coming to us outside of the United States. Uh, we love to see where everyone's coming from. Uh, plus, if you're coming from one of the local counties, it helps us with funding through the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, which is a, a, a penny tax that goes to all of the nonprofit cultural organizations in our area. So thank you to SCFD citizens. All right, looks like we have great participation. A lot of people joining us from elsewhere in the United States. So thank you for tuning in tonight. All right, we will close that poll. So um, here we have, we're from, again, the Molly Brown House Museum, which is located in Denver, Colorado. There's our beautiful home on the right, which is where Mrs. Margaret Tobin Brown lived um, from 1894 until uh, the house was in her death until 1932 when she passed away. She stopped living here full time in about 1911, so just shortly before her Titanic experience. After that point, uh, she turned it over to be rented out to different families. Um, in fact, our house at one point was the governor's mansion of Colorado. Uh, the governor lived here in our home. In so a beautiful home located in Denver's historic Capitol Hill neighborhood. Mrs. Brown was quite influential here in Denver and Colorado, raising money for different philanthropic charities. Um, but then really um, her impact on the world expanded after she was one of the survivors of the, of the Titanic disaster. And with the 110th anniversary of the disaster this year, we have an exhibit called Heroine of the Titanic, which is open until September 25th at the museum. Um, and we explore all facets of uh, what it was like for Mrs. Brown to be one of those people on the Titanic as a survivor, um, as well as um, who were the other people on this ship. If you'd like to, you're welcome to open up the camera on your phone and scan one of those two QR codes. The one on the left is English, the one on the right is Spanish. And that will get you to our digital museum guide that folks use when they're exploring our house. Uh, but it'll have all of the pictures and things that people who are going through the house will see. So it'll give you a flavor if you can't join us in Denver of what this exhibit is about. Uh, the top right photograph is a picture of a little object. It's hard to see, but it is a little Egyptian talisman called a new Shopti. And Mrs. Brown had purchased that in a marketplace in Cairo right before boarding the Titanic in Cherbourg, France. Um, that was in her pocket throughout the entirety of the Titanic disaster. And then in the month after, she gave that to Captain Rostrand the, of the rescue ship Carpathia as a personal note of thanks uh, for saving her life. And she hoped it would bring him continuing good luck in his travels on the sea. This is the first time that this Ushapti that belonged to Mrs. Brown and then was given to Captain Rostrand has been on exhibit in our museum. So we're very pleased to have it on display thanks to um, the Stanley and Laurel Lair collection who loaned us out to us. Um, and then below that, you'll also see other things in the house such as telegrams that Mrs. Brown received while on the Carpathia from family members and friends expressing their gratefulness that she had, she had survived the disaster. Um, but one thing we talk about in this exhibit and a lot when we talk about Mrs. Brown and the Titanic is that, well, when we think about the ship, 
we most often think of it as a luxury liner with these first class passengers, you know, globe trotting across the Atlantic Ocean in this luxuriously outfitted ship making its maiden voyage. Uh, but the Titanic was really an emigrant ship, uh, mostly comprised of people who were starting a new life in the United States and coming from countries all over the world. And I think that is something that really surprises people to know that how many of those second and third class passengers were immigrants and how many were coming from such a vast array of countries from around the globe. Um, so that's what brings us here tonight to sort of understand who these people were on board the ship with um, a great percentage of, of them being from countries like Sweden and Norway, and then another big percentage of passengers coming from Syria. So we are going to let our two esteemed authors tell us all about uh, their research into these different facets of the story of the Titanic. I love this slide too. So these are both slides for the National Archives and Records Administration. These are the actual sort of um, manifest of passengers coming from the Titanic as they're getting off of the Carpathia into New York City and they're being recorded as they're coming through immigration. Uh, so you can see countries like Syria, like Sweden, like Ireland, Poland, this vast array of people coming to the United States. So all of those uh, records reflect these stories. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and I'm going to share another screen so that we can turn it over to Ms. Lily Satterdahl, who is going to tell us about her research on the Swedish passengers aboard the Titanic. Uh, we are going to just sort of scroll through this presentation as Miss Lily uh, tells us about her work. So Lily, it's all to you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be asked to be here today. And I'm glad to hear about the exhibit, the Titanic exhibit that you are having. In 2017, I enjoyed a special tour of the Molly Brown House and Museum. Uh, and today, I appreciate the invitation to speak together with Le Leila Elias at this event hosted by the museum director, Andrea Malcolm. Here's a picture of, of the museum, and here's a picture of some pictures of me here when my book, um, my, not my time book came out and you can see two early novels that I wrote about the Titanic. But we're gonna speak about the people in my nonfiction book, Not My Time to Die, Titanic and the Swedes on board. It was published by New Trena, New York on April 15, 2012 on the exact day, date of the 100th anniversary of the sinking. Then I had the pleasure of attending the anniversary commemoration in New York in 2012 and have a book signing there. Here I am with Robert Bracken of the Titanic Historical Society. I also met Charles Haas and many other Titanic researchers, authors, and enthusiasts from the entire country and from Europe. The most memorable presentation I have done about the sweeps on the Titanic was at the Johnson County Historical Society in Coralville, Iowa, five years ago with a fantastic Titanic tea based on original recipes from the Titanic and served in Victorian style. Now, why did the Swedes want to emigrate to America at the time? The lack of opportunities for the rapidly growing population, dissatisfaction with the prevailing conditions in Sweden, and a wish to escape the mandatory military service for men were the primary reasons. Four Swedes sailed in first class, seven in second class, and 112 in third class for a total of 123. For some of them, it was not their first voyage to the United States. Many of them had relatives in America. I didn't find any paupers among the Swedes. Most of the Swedish passengers were ticketed in Sweden to sail on other ships. When they arrived in Southampton, they were transferred to the new Titanic of the White Star Line. 
due to a coal strike, there wasn't enough coal for all the ships to sail. And the Titanic was large enough to take all the New York bound passengers that were gathered in Southampton. Of the circa 2,200 passengers and crew on the Titanic, about 1,500 perished, while about 700 were rescued by the ship Carpathia. By the way, its captain, Mr. Rostron, was Swedish. The original name was probably Rodström. He was born in London to parents who had recently arrived from Sweden. If he hadn't decided to turn his ship around and head for the disaster site, no one would have been saved. Once the survivors arrived in America, they were interviewed by newspaper reporters. Most of the accounts I read were in the Swedish lang language. I was happy to be able to translate these first, please move, <laughs> impressions and to follow up with information about the lives after the Titanic. I contacted descendants of some of the survivors and obtained copies of more interviews and letters to relatives. Not My Time to Die documents 34 survivors and 89 victims. Of the 25 Swedish children, only six survived. I used multiple and varied sources that are listed in the beginning of the book and added 565 footnotes. More men than women perished due to the marital rule at the time, women and children first. Some of the Swedish men jumped into the water and hung on to wreckage for so long that they were covered with ice when being picked up. There are many compelling stories about both among the survivors and the victims. And I have chosen to speak about two families and the choices they made when they learned that the husband and father could not be saved. Another story is about a man who was already living in Chicago and waited for his family to survive. The first story is about the Anderson family of seven. It begins on page 212. The members of the family were present at the farewell party held at the church for 11 people in their party. Only one of them survived. Here you can see the Anderson children sitting in the front row. It's heartbreaking. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Anderson, their four daughters and one son between two and 11 years old. And here is a picture of the family in my book. It says here they decided to die together. And on the right page, you will see the cabin they occupied, a third class cabin like the one the Anderson family occupied. There were two more bunks on the right side. And then they had a wash stand in the middle. You have to imagine the last view of the parents flanking their children, standing by the railing, kissing each other goodbye, holding hands and jumping overboard, wearing no life jackets. There was an eyewitness who saw them. Why do you think the parents would have made the decision to die together? They were headed to St. James, Manitoba, Canada, where they had bought land. Their bodies were not recovered. Homesteading would have been hard, even with Mr. Anderson doing most of the work. Imagine what it would have been like without him. They must have regretted their decision to, to emigrate. In Sweden, they owned a farm and were said to be well off. But an immigrant agent came to the parish and enticed them to emigrate to Canada where they would get more land and they fell for it. Their farm was sold to finance the journey 
and expenses of homesteading. The emigrant agent, Mr. Danbaum, who was from Stanton, Iowa, his wife and baby were also on board a Titanic and perished. Mr. Danbaum's body was recovered. He carried $275 in cash, 30 in gold, and a check in the amount of $1,315. The following items were found on him a watch and chain, an opal ruby ring, and a diamond ring. The only survivor in the group was 22 year old Anna Nystian. After her rescue, she said, it was not my time to die. That's how I got the title to my book. She also said, I was meant to experience more of the world. She had planned to return to Sweden, but when the Lusitania was torpedoed and sank in 1915, she decided to leave New York and move to Des Moines, Iowa. She married a Swedish man and they had four children. Anna lived until 1977. I was survived by two sons, one daughter and six grandchildren. She had visited Sweden two times. As a comparison to the Anderson family, I want to tell you about another Swedish family of seven. The Asplund family headed for Worcester, Massachusetts. They had lived in America before. Mr. Asplund made a different kind of decision. The story begins on page 104. The five-year-old Lillian and three-year-old Felix had been placed in a lifeboat and the people in the boat demanded that the mother join them. The mother, Selma, thought that the rest of the family would follow. Now you come, she called out to her husband and all the sons standing by the railing. But her husband just shook his head. Selma screamed, why did you do that? Why couldn't we die together? Her husband probably reasoned that his wife would get help from relatives in Worcester to raise two children and that five children would be too many for her to support. So he kept the three eldest boys with him. They were 13, nine and five. The five-year-old boy was the twin brother of Lillian in the lifeboat. So how did Selma manage? You can see some pictures here to the left. She and her children were taken in by her sister and her husband in Worcester. The Gethsemane Lutheran Church held a benefit for her and the city of Worcester raised $2,000 for her that was invested and used as needed. In the 1920 federal census, she was listed as head of her household, renter and laundress. Selma took in laundry in her home for a fee. It was one way for a widow to support her children, except for taking in boarders. Photos of Selma Esplund, um, they were courtesy of Andrew Aldrich. In 1930, Selma was supported by her daughter Lillian, a typist, and her son Felix, a factory draftsman. Neither one of them married. Selma lived until the age of 90, and her daughter Lillian until she was almost 100. After her passing, a shoebox was found in her home containing letters, photos, and mementos that included her father's pocket watch, and a contract for passage that had been kept dry in Mr. Esplund's life jacket until his body was recovered 12 days later. He wore striped trousers, and that's probably why his body was recovered. Mr. Esplund had paid 795 Swedish crowns for the ticket, or tickets equal to about $212 at the time. The 365 items found in Lillian Esplund's shoebox 
were expected to bring in a combined sum of about $300,000. Here's a photo of Lilia, she's a beautiful lady, at an auction held in London in 2018. Emigration contracts sold for over $65,000. His pocket watch sold for nearly $62,000. And the family inland passage tickets for 54,000. The White Star Line had returned the items to the family because it considered them to be of small value. One of the items was a letter from Selma that said, my nerves are so weak and my eyes are so poor because I've been crying so much. Selma said that her husband had carried the profits from selling their farm, but no cash was found on his body. What do you think happened to the cash? Selma received $2,700 from the White Star Line for the loss of her husband and family provider. Of course, she had lost their trunks that contained their clothing and family silver. The reason for the high auction prices was that anything connected with the passengers on the Titanic has become extremely valuable. There are collectors all over the world who are willing to pay astonishing prices. Now, who do you think made the best decision? The Anderson couple or Mr. Asplund? What would you do if you had to make that choice in a hurry? Mrs. Anderson had a sister in Winnipeg. She could have gone there with the children. She could have sold the land they had bought. Did the parents do the right thing when they decided that the children would also have to die? Their strong fate might have had something to do with it. Did Mr. Asplund do the right thing when he decided that even the five-year-old twin boy would have to go down with the ship? There are many heart-wrenching stories about families that were separated. One mother traveled alone with her four children, two to nine years old, to join her husband, Niels Paulson, in Chicago. He had emigrated in 1910 and in 1912, he has saved enough money to send for his family. The story begins on page 267. When Alma came up on deck with her children, she asked, she asked a fellow Swedish passenger if he could hold on to two of them. He did so until the water became too high and he lost his grip on them and both children disappeared. Why wasn't Alma and her children put in a lifeboat? The fact is that many third-class women and children were left behind. Here is how Alma's husband reacted when finding out what had happened to his family. According to one story, Paulson looked pale and ill when he leaned hungry-eyed over the desk and asked in broken English, if there was an accounting for his wife and children. The clerk scanned the list of saved third-class passengers but failed to find their names. Paulson answered hopefully that perhaps they didn't sail. When they were found on that list, he realized what had happened. Paulson was then assisted to a seat where he fainted. The face and hands of the unconscious man were dead in cold water. A friend arrived and assisted a grief-stricken man out of the building. His entire family was gone. An unknown child buried in the next plot. Oh, Alma's body was recovered and brought to Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax. The bodies of her children were not recovered. Most of the bodies were never found. They went down to the ship. An unknown child buried in the next plot was thought to be that of her youngest child, Justa. But later DNA tests showed that he was an English child. 
There is no record on Nils Paulson having received any compensation for the loss of his family. Apparently, a wife had no monetary value. Alma's mother in Sweden received some compensation. Nils Paulson stayed in the United States, remarried, and had another child. He died in 1962. This is the inscription on the Paulson headstone. Alma Paulson lost with four children, April 15, 1912. Wife of Nils Paulson in the Titanic. Torborg, it should be Torborg. Darnia, age nine. Paul Folke, age six. Stina Viola, age four. Gösta Leonard, age two. The great number was 206. The bodies recovered were mostly those of well-dressed men whose families could afford a private burial. The bodies were judged according to the clothing they wore. Some wore only night clothes. The rich American and British gentlemen on board dressed in their black tails to make sure their bodies would be picked up. Most other victims that were recovered were returned to the sea. On a lighter note, I will mention that a rich Australian man planned to build a replica of the Titanic and sell it in rapid traffic around the world. His name is Clive Palmer, and he has my book, Not My Time to Die. His grandiose plan was made public after the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking, and people began to book tickets. At first, he said the ship would sail in 2016, then in 2018. I hurried up and wrote the novel, Titanic Sailing Again, that was published in 2019, also by Neutranon. But I was afraid that the new Titanic would beat me to it. As it turned out, I have plenty of time because Titanic 2 apparently has still not been built. The last I saw on the internet was that it would sail in 2022, and I don't think that will happen. In my novel, Titanic Sailing Again, I call my ship Titanic Princess, and sail it from China, where it had been, has been built, to Dubai, then on to Southampton, UK, and of course, my ship sails to New York. That was the route uh, Clive Palmer had expected to sail. And then something unexpected happens. Thanks for listening and viewing. You will find my books on the Amazon.com. Thank you so much, Lily. That was just amazing to hear about all of those families. And I know um, the tremendous loss within the Swedish uh, folks on the Titanic. Does anyone, I'm going to stop sharing so we can all see each other's faces again. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask Lily? Please feel free to drop them in the chat and we will ask them for you. Or if you feel brave today, you're welcome to unmute yourself um, or raise your hand and ask Lily a question. We'll, we'll um, ask questions with Lily for a minute or two before we move on to our next speaker. I think you did such a good job, Lily, that there's no questions. <laughs> oh, here we go. Someone has asked, Lily, does, does Sweden hold an annual memorial for the victims of the Titanic, or perhaps are they memorialized in other ways in Sweden? I don't know, but I don't think uh, there is a memorial annually. I haven't heard of one. In doing my research too, I don't know if I came across any plaques or memorials in Sweden um, to the Swedish passengers, but that's a good question. And I will do a little bit more research. And if I find something, I will include it in my follow-up email. I've seen on cemeteries, they, they make, have markers for the people who died on the Titanic in Sweden. Okay. In Sweden, in cemeteries or here in the US? Sweden. Yeah. Well, that's good to know then. And great question. I will follow up with that one. 
All right, well, thank you, Lily. And please feel free to continue to drop questions in the chat. We can circle back around. I'm gonna turn it over to Leela Saloon Elias, who's going to talk to us about okay. the Syrian passengers on the Titanic. Okay, before I before I began, there was little written about the Syrian passengers. And as I was explaining earlier with you, Andrea, and with Lily, there's a tough time in research when you don't have, well, English is your main language, but then you meet up with another language that is not easily uh, transliterated or transcribed. And in 1912, when the names are coming in, uh, a few days after when the third steerage names are coming in, the names are all garbled. That was the main um, reason I wanted to work on the book is to get the names correct because everybody has their there's a reason you're put on earth and when you go you'd like to have your name remembered and especially families that lost that lost um their sons their daughters their wives their husbands so in 1912 was part of the mass migration from 1880 we'll know to 1924 of immigrants coming to the United States. So 1912 falls into there. And of course, there were Syrians that were on the ship. Not of course, a lot of people didn't know that until um, my book came out, including Syrian, Sy the Syrian people too. Um, the reason that uh, 1912, uh, the passage of 1912 and before and after is that uh, the Arabs were living under Ottoman occupation. 400 years of Ottoman occupation and um, the empire uh, was not uh, towards the end. Uh, There's a stagnant economy. The peasants were um, had land, but they didn't really own it because uh, because of the uh, inconsistencies with governmental rules and policies and the Tunzi map that came in. Uh, peasants were affected mostly. There was also the silk the silk um, the silkworm industry in the northern part of. Uh, first of all, let me first of all let me explain something. The Syrians I speak of in 1912, it was greater Syria. Today, the countries that the Syrians came from have been after the Sykes-Picot Agreement in 1917 when the British and French came and divided up the Middle East and made countries that they wanted. Those countries now fall into Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, and Jordan. The majority of the passengers, the Syrian passengers, who I refer to as Syrian because that's what they were, um, are today in present day Lebanon, the, the majority of them. There's one woman that is from Syria proper today, but again, those were uh, colonial power borders that were made then when they split up the country. So we have people coming mostly, unlike Lily saying that there were, you didn't find any paupers. I had a lot of paupers there. The majority of people that the Syrians that came on the Titanic were peasants, um, not just farmers. A lot of them just were poor. Uh, and under the Ottoman rule, you, you had a farm, you had sheep, you had, uh, livestock, but they could come in any time and take them. That's how bad the economy was then. Nothing was moving forward. So a lot of them came. Many came to join people already here. Some were first-time travelers. Some were already here and had gone back. There was a man named Hamna uh, Yusuf Mu'awad who went back to home to pick up his son who was 16 years old to bring him back to study at Ohio State University. Um, they both perished in the sinking. The um, there is also a, a woman. Uh, let me see, um, Shanini, who came from home as well. Uh, she came. She survived. She had been here since 1900, uh, early 1900s. She went back because her son had fallen ill. There's a long story behind her. Um, she came back. She survived, and she ended up raising a family that did something. I mean, it's part of the United States. I'll get to her later. Uh, as for the number of Syrians, I'm always asked that. I never give a number because some official accounts say 81. That's impossible. Survivors at the time from the Syrian survivors uh, say between 125 to 165 with 145 being the average mean. Now, you'll say, how did they get that many? Well, I'll get to that as well, too. There are a lot of names. Now, they didn't carry passports at the time. We have the White Star Papers and so on. But um, there's too many inconsistencies with there could have been these people on on the Titanic. Granted, at that time, when you left Syria in March, in mid-March, and you traveled to Marseille and you took a train to Cherbourg, that would have taken a month. So people that they never heard from again, yes, there are people that say they must have been on the Titanic, but the pa passengers that I put into my book are the ones that I am uh, the ones that aren't listed on official records, are, I'm 99.9% .9 sure they were there. For instance, 
passengers that aren't listed. I have five Palestinians from Palestine proper that are mentioned in one newspaper, Arabic newspaper. I should tell you as well. I went to the English newspapers first, got the lists of names, all garbled. Again, I explained why at the beginning, because of the Arabic language and the Semitic tongue being different from the um, uh, Latin script. Uh, when I went to the Arabic newspapers, the names began to fall together. One Arabic newspaper, Al-Bashir, printed an article about five Palestinian young men who um, drowned on the Titan, or went down with the ship, but they're considered heroes because they explain that they took their clothing and tried to help people like babies down into the uh, down into the lifeboats, helped women in and so on. And the five died. That has been my uh, my enigma because I haven't been able to find who they are in any other papers, even coordinating them with English names and so on, or the white star lists. However, Recently, I've, I'm, I did the one book, I'm updating my old book, and I've got a lot more information. One of the bits of information is from the Tulkarim Museum in Tulkarim, Occupied Palestine. Um, in that, it's a Palestinian heritage museum, and they have, you know, the clothing, they have the money that was used during Palestine, during the mandate, and so on. They have a, a bell. It's a big bell. It looks like our Liberty Bell here, but it's a big bell. And it's listed as one of the five that were commissioned to be made by the five families, each one having lost their son. That's the link to those five passengers. I have another set of 11 people who boarded from who boarded at um, Cherbourg from somewhere around Beirut, the Murad family, who until today, they don't have proof, but until today say that seven members of their family died. The, how they know is that one that survived, a woman, went back to uh, Syria and she gave, the, I mean, she, they knew the names and so on. That's another verification I need as well. There are other people too. I found other names, um, uh, a couple that survived with their daughter. And under that, under that, um, that's, they're not on any list, not on any official list. But that was in a Philadelphia newspaper uh, reported twice that they were survivors of the Titanic. And in fact, no, I'm sorry, the husband didn't survive. And the husband is linked to being like, whether you're rich or poor, you could have been a hero because he was supposed to have helped other people on the ship too, like John Jacob Astor. Uh, speaking of which, now I'm going to get into some of the passengers that uh, were interesting. They're all interesting, but some that stood out more. A young girl by the name of Adele Najib Kiami. Now the names, here we go with the names. We have the first names. I, if you look in my book, I have them listed alphabetically by first name because the last names, they're either the father's first name becomes the surname, the husband's first name becomes the surname and so on. Or you can become an Arabic um, as a male you're, and you have children. You're no, you no long, people no longer refer to you by your first name. You become the father of Abu so-and-so. So it was just easier just to take that first name and list them that way. Adele Kiami came from a town, uh, bigger than a town, called Schwer, which is in today's Lebanon. They had a university there, they had pharmacies and so on. So it wasn't a village, it was a town. Her father had come in 1907 with another um, friend of his from the same town. And uh, they had set up in New York. And why this father is important is because in that village today are still the letters that he sent before 19, before the Titanic uh, sailed and after its sinking to his family members that are still there with the family. I was lucky to get those newspapers from an editor of a newspaper in uh, Beirut who gave them to me because he, he understood the importance of getting this story out. Uh, he wrote, first of all, about peddling. A lot of the Syrians did peddle, a lot of them. The women that were here, um, even the ones that I told you that one had gone there and come back, she was a peddler or they cleaned houses and so on. Peddling was an easy profession because uh, you didn't need the language as much, but was the nice, th the nice thing was that you learned the language while you were peddling. Uh, you made your own profit. You could come and go as you pleased. So that was an easy way to make money. They came, came here to make money. Many wanted to go back. That was the majority thought to go back. Uh, Shanini, for instance, came here to make money to send back home so her husband could build a bigger house because her kids and her sister and brother-in-law lived all in one little shack. So now the house would be bigger. Um, you have newlyweds. 
Now we know about Isidore Strauss and Ida Strauss, how they didn't leave each other. I have four or five um, newlywed couples among the Syrians, uh, three of which refused to leave each other as well. And how do we know those stories? It's, it feels like I have to always prove myself. It's from the survivors from these villages. Um, two villages that were that were highly represented on the Titanic are Hardin, which is in northern um, Lebanon today, and uh, Kafar Mishki, which is just south of Beirut, another village uh, near where my grandparents, my father, my paternal grandparents came from. Um, they, uh, the family, the families in Hardin that lost the largest number of uh, passengers on the ship were hit hard. The repercussions of the sinking, not only for families here, but back home. The main breadwinners of the family died on the Titanic. We have a lot of them from Hardin coming to Wilkes-Barre near, near Allentown, where I live in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, young, young men that were coming because the young men were sent because they could work the longer hours. Uh, they could uh, make more money, basically. And some of the young boys, like one boy, Butra Saman, came to meet his mother, and he was with his mother's brother, his maternal uncle. They both died in the sinking. Uh, we have Mariam Asaf from Ottawa, returning to Ottawa. She was another enigma because there is no Mariam Asaf from the village of Kafir Mishki. The great part about my research was when I finally got to the Arabic newspapers that were published in New York in 1912. Arabic newspapers gave Arabic names and they gave the proper names and the proper um, uh, designation of the village or region from where they were from. So it was easier when I did my footwork, literally went to the villages and so on, or spoke to the descendants, I was able to uh, put everything together better. Marian Asaf's real name was Zad Nasrallah. So you can see the discrepancy there. And I knew that because in one of the Arabic newspapers, there is a headline that states, who is Maryam Asaf from Kafir Mishki? Now, understandably, many immigrants that did not know English when they left their native lands came to areas in the United States or Canada, Australia as well, where family members, cousins, or people from their same town had migrated because it would be more of a cushion for them to arrive. That's, that's, that's normally what happens with immigrants when you don't have English as your major, as your um, main language. So um, the Kafir Mishki crowd, everybody knew in Ottawa. That's where she was from. Uh, they knew who she was. But in the Arabic newspapers, because they were printed in uh, New York or Brooklyn, and they were sent all around the United States, even my grandfather would get them in Western Canada. Uh, people were asking, who is, who is Mary Asaf? Because you knew a person, person's surname reflected the village. There was no Asaf in Kafir Mishki. So She's interviewed and she said, my name is actually Zad Nasrallah, wife of Kuzma, daughter Nasrallah. And that's confirmed when I did my interviews with the descendants and that was her name. Um, she is interviewed in the Montreal Gazette and the Ottawa Citizen and it's picked up in New York and other newspapers around the United States, which is very interesting, her story, saying that all of the, all of her mem all of the members from Kafir Mishki, that was the second largest uh, group of um, passengers from that village, um, had died. And she says she saw people shot, her own people shot, um, that the, the, the claim that women and children went first didn't happen in steerage because her two cousins, she saw them drown. I mean, basically drown. Another woman, I refer to the shootings because it's a, when I first started writing, it was a, um, what's it called? Like you, you, did, you weren't supposed to touch that. I was told by many people, I shouldn't talk about that. But as I, as I was explaining earlier with Lily and Andre, you know, you just have to think logically sometimes when people are going crazy, when they know they're going to die, that there's no lifeboat left and they're going to jump in the water, they're going to do anything to get in and they're going to do anything to save their lives. And the officers are supposed to keep order on the ship. Yes, there's going to be shootings. I, I'm not saying it just off the top of my head. It's just logical. You want to save your life. You're just going to pandemonium. Um, passengers, steering passengers talking about the gates being dropped that they couldn't get up. And when by the time they got up, there were no boats and so on. So yes, there were Syrian men that ran that ran to the boats. And I think in the Senate hearings, they refer, they, they don't refer to Syrian men. A lot of times they're referred to as Italian. And there weren't that many Italians on, on the Titanic, as far as I remember. So they must have been saying, yes, they ran, because that's what your natural reaction is. You want to save your own life. Um, so she she confirms that. Uh, shootings by, uh, I also have uh, 
well, in, in my new version, I have a lot of um, passengers from second and third class, not not Syrian, but um, who refer to the shootings as well. I'll, I'll just I just wanted to touch on that to refer to that. Um, uh, also, other passengers that were of interest uh, that may be of interest. Only one. They were all third class passengers. Syrians were all third class passengers in steerage, except for one couple who boarded at Cherbourg, and they were uh, the Nasrallahs. That was Adele Nasrallah, the woman, Nicola, or Nicholas Nasrallah, um, who has had lived in the United States. His family was in California, and very interestingly, his family. They were well off. They had started the first Nickelodeon in the United States in California. And they had a theater, the Castro Theater, that they also ran. They had a candy confectionery, very well-known family. Their name changes over time to Nasrallah Nasser. That's how that's hard. You have to keep changing names. Anyhow, he went back to get married and he met Adele in um, I think it was uh Zharta, I think. No, Zahli, Zahli. So they got married. She was only 14. But again, that was that's how they did it at the time. My grandmother was 14, for instance, when she got married. Anyhow, so they get married. They go on, according to the family, according to Adele's family, they went on a honeymoon through Europe. They went to Brazil because her brother was there. And then they came back and then they went on a tour through Europe. And then they went to um, Marseille, heard about the Titanic and boarded the Titanic as second, I'm sorry, at, at Cherbourg as second class passengers. Nicola's name came through on the telegraph as Nick, Nicole, I don't know how it was in English, but it was garbled. And they didn't say Nasrallah, they said Nasser. Now, the, what happened in the Arabic newspapers, there was a big merchant in Cairo at the time by the name of Nicola Nasser. And all newspapers are reporting that he had died on the Titanic, but that wasn't him. It was Then they, they realized it after a few days and they say, no, it was Nicholas Nasrallah. Nicola's, Nas, Nicola Nasrallah's body um, was taken to Halifax, it was found. And initially, they thought his body was John Jacob Astor's. Now, I'm going to show you while I'm talking to you some pictures. Um, share screen, let's see. I'm going to show you Nicholas Nasrallah. Let's see here. This is Nicholas Nasrallah. So they thought, and then they had to verify that that, can you see that? Can all of you see that? Okay, so that's Nicholas Nasrallah. He was about 33. And that picture is at his nephew's house in Beirut, a very kind man, but they, they still carry the whole story. Um, he, was, he was going back to New York. Adele, his wife, 14 years old, was put on the lifeboat. He put her on the lifeboat and she told him to come with him. She couldn't speak English. And he said, I'll follow you. And she said the last thing she saw was him standing on the deck, the normal how a lot of women saw their husband standing on the deck, but he was smoking a cigarette. And he said to her, I'll follow you, I'll follow you. So when she went to New York, she waited for days because she, he told her he was going to follow her. And she went to the White Star Line. Um, they rep A lot of newspapers report about her that she was stunningly beautiful. Anyhow, um, this is her in 19, I think it's 1916. She ends up going to New York. Her, her husband's cousin picks her up from New York. Uh, but He's not the. She doesn't have a husband now, and now her brother, who was in, uh, New, he was in in Ohio. He comes to New York to pick her up, and they live a pauper life. This is Adele when she eventually gets she gets married and has um, uh, a family. That was in 1916. Adele's family, uh, when I did my first interviews, told me that she was pregnant. She was still considered a newlywed because. Um, in the Middle East, uh, some families still do it now. When a girl gets married, they put henna on their fingernails. It looks like red nail polish and on their fingertips and were uh, other places on their body. She still had that along with another, uh, other, the other newlywed couples, the brides as well. So she comes and she goes to stay with her sister in Cleveland. And her family told me she had a baby boy who died nine days after. That's what they knew. The truth is, after much more research, no, in December, December 9th, I think it was of 1912, she had a baby girl and uh, the girl's name was Elizabeth. And that I know that from a letter that was published in, I, I don't remember the name of the paper, but Angus something. Um, it was printed in Arabic and also in English, uh, but I did a better translation of it. 
and she writes the letter to John Jacob Astor's wife, confirming that she was on the same lifeboat as John Jacob, as Madeline Astor. Uh, but then again, that's questionable too by other people, but this is what she says in the letter. I remember when you put the jacket around me and who, who would think now, I'm just paraphrasing, who would think now that two women that were pregnant are, have their babies and you're gonna live the life, your son, your son or daughter will have the life of a upper class and I'm gonna live like a pauper. That's basically what she said. And she gives some other information in there. The other newlywed couple and who the newspapers wrote about at the White Star Line, describing her hair as, like it, it was like reading a romance novel, how beautiful her hair was in her eyes, but she was very pretty. Silana Yazbek, another 14 year old. Well, that's a small picture, but there she's a widow. And she again thought her husband was coming to um, join her. And then she finds out her, from the Arabic newspapers, I found out that her, her and her sister Amina, uh, I don't know where I have a picture of her. Amina, um, come back on the Titanic. They survive. Amina has two little boys. One of them uh, falls into the water and uh, she actually saves the boy. But um, they go back with their father comes to pick them up from Wilkesbury and takes them back. So she's a widow at the age of 14. She eventually gets married. Uh, let's see. This is her late in later years. That's her and her new husband, Dacker, but they're all from the same family. So Wilkesbury had the Hardeen contingent. Um, another survivor is this guy who, and initially I think it's in Colonel Gracie's book. He's listed as a, as a, as a that he died in the sinking, but no, he actually survived. This gentleman never spoke. He would not be interviewed. He did not want to. This is Mubarak Asi. I don't know how, I forget what his name is in English, but he was from Hardeen as well. Just, hor they were all horror stories. What, who I spoke to the children, the grandchildren, they had to pull words out of their grandparents or their parents' mouths. I have a woman who didn't even know that her father was on the Titanic till he was on his deathbed, that little bark. This is another uh, person who survived. He was from um, uh, Shanae in today's Lebanon. He survived, he had two of his nephews with him or cousins, one nephew, um, Hussein, who was 12 years old, and Farid, who was 18. He said that he carried Hussein on his shoulders, but with the commotion in the pen, he lost, he lost the boy. They did not survive. He was expecting to find both boys on the Carpathia. He did not. And uh, again, in the Arabic newspapers, I find out where he's, he's going. Most of them are going to New York, Michigan, Michigan City. Um, uh, let's see, where else? Dewejik. We have this guy here. Now, let me see if I have his family, but this is George, uh, his name is Georges Tama, which is George Thomas in English. He was one of the last survivors of the Titanic who died, I don't know how many years ago, but he used to give interviews and so on. He, he and his um, sister and their mother were coming to join their father, who was already here in Dwajik, and he worked on a muck farm. I didn't know what a muck farm was until my dad explained it to me. So, I mean, they took any jobs just to make the money. And the father worked long, hard hours. I don't know how, how many years, but ended up saving enough money to send for them. The another family, now this one, this is an interesting family too. Let me see, what time is it? Am I running short on time? I still have some time, five minutes, okay. I, I just like to bring some of these people to life again. This is Katrina Rizik Butros Yusuf, Catherine Joseph. That was one of the uh, interesting, when I was going through the names, I saw Catherine Joseph among all the English names. I thought, huh, wonder if she's Syrian. And there she is. This was this picture was given to me by her son, Michael, who's, who's deceased now. Michael was a survivor of the Titanic. This is Michael here. This is, I, I forget which year this is taken, but now the, we have the story of Katrina Rizek. This is her husband. This is her brother. The interesting th thing for me wasn't just the pictures, but the telegrams I got copies of from him that he sent me that she had sent to her brother and her husband while she was recuperating in New York. Well, actually her kids were, they had measles, I believe, and they, they couldn't be sent home. This woman becomes very important for another, um, another passenger who's um, a, a gentleman in Chatham, Ontario in Canada. 
by the name of Henry Boulos had sent money back home to his brother to buy tickets for his wife, Sultana, and his two children, Nur Ayn, the girl who becomes known as Lorraine or Lorette, and the boy, Akar. They board the Titanic and he knows nothing. He doesn't, he doesn't know they're on the Titanic. He just knows that they're leaving at a certain time. And again, like Lily said, you want the fastest for the Syrians, you want the fastest way to get to the States. They didn't have the money to spend on hotels in Marseille. The Nasrallahs did, maybe the Yazbeks did, but for the average Syrian passenger, no, they didn't have that extra money. So they wanted to get on the first ship and the fastest ship. And this was, it was also being advertised, of course, as the safest ship, albeit the maiden voyage. So Harry Bullis is waiting, waiting, waiting to hear a word. And then he gets a call from Detroit from a gentleman by the name of Dick Zakur, who was not on the Titanic, but he says, I need you to come to Detroit right away. And he said, do you have any word? Do you know what, why is my wife there and the kids? And he said, I need, he, all he told him was come right away. So Harry Bullis, because the names aren't printed, even the name, her name that comes up on the list eventually from Cherbourg as a victim is nowhere near his wife's name. He goes to Detroit with hopes that the wife is, is going to surprise him with the kids. And he finds out from a woman reported by the name of Beatrice Yowell, who turns out to be, you see how I'm working with the names? Katrina Yusuf. And how I know that is because Sultana, Harry Bullis's family, is from the same village as this woman, and they traveled together. So she confirms the death of his wife and the two children. Anyhow, those are the stories of, there's a lot of other stories, but um, in the main, the effect of the of the Titanic sinking on uh, on um, on the villages back home hit hard. And I'll, here, there was a, a gentleman in um, what's it called Texarkana, Arkansas, who was waiting for his daughter. He would had uh, he, I guess he was he couldn't um, um, he was paralyzed or something. He was waiting for his daughter to come, and she was coming. He knew she was on the Titanic because. In Marseille, there were some hotels owned by Syrians, and one of the gentlemen telegraphed him and told him, your daughter's on the Titanic with, uh, with her uh, brother-in-law, because he had a daughter here, and she was coming to stay with him, and she died, and he ended up dying himself not too shortly afterwards. Anyhow, there's a lot of stories about the Syrians. If you have any questions, there's, there's too many. I had 400 and something pages in the book, so I want to cut it short just in case, oh, you have, what, two minutes left for questions if there are any. We do have some questions that okay. have been rolling in. So you did mention, um, you know, like the Swedish passengers, they sort of, some of them just sort of wound up on the Titanic, whether it was yep. due to the coal yep. shortage and the, you know, not as many ships. I'm, I'm sure the Syri Syrian passengers experienced that same thing, like you said, get on the quickest and fastest yep. ship. Yep. Um, and then another person asked, were there members of the Titanic who could speak Swedish or Syrian or other languages? Do you two have an answer to that? I, I have an answer for me. For me, the ones that were returning, uh, Shanina could speak English. And that uh, jo Hannah, Hannah Mouawad, he the one that uh, was bringing his son back. Th there's an interesting story about him. He's His name is listed in the Arabic newspapers, but the Arabic newspapers the English newspapers, when the people were searching, only saw the name John Thomas. For the people from his village around the United States, they had no idea that this was the same person. So she clarifies the names of all the people that were with her. She had a young girl with her. And Shanina's story, when she arrives, she ends up going to the Hebrew Sheltering Society, who were taking in different passengers. Um, she ends up explaining who was on the ship with her and who did not. The girl that, and that that was picked up all across the United States. Almost every newspaper that covered uh, the the sinking on the 23rd to the 24th mentioned her story that this woman, a Syrian woman by the name of H-A-P-U-S-H, that's how they get her name, Shanini Wehbi, I don't know how that, that happened, carrying a young girl. So Benura, the girl that was with her, ends up going to Cleveland, going to Ohio, had a brother there, but she's on her way to Canada and what happens there in Canada, she's going to her uncle. Her uncle sees her, closes the door on her and says to her, I don't want you in my house because my son died on the Titanic. So I was able to link daughter who died with her as a cousin. So, I mean, they're sad stories. The one good story that came out of this, Shanini, that woman from to whom her, her 95 year old daughter I interviewed who told me, could you call me tomorrow morning? It was 7.30, I'm going to bed now because I have to get up, I get up every morning, bake bread at 5.30. Told me the expression in Arabic, 
she's och de Rigel, which means that she is like like a man. She 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 took that journey to the states on her own as a woman. She worked hard like a dog, cleaned houses, she peddled, she went door to door, sent money back. And the only reason she went back in 19, 1911 was because her son was ill and he eventually dies. She, he dies before she reaches there. Her husband dies there. She brings the family eventually back. But, oh, and oh, by the way, when her, when the sinking took place, she was, um, her hair was black. By the time she arrived in, um, in um, Ohio, her hair had turned white. That's reported in the newspapers too. Mm -hmm. But yes, they did speak English. The problem with the language though, 95% of the Syrians had no idea what EXIT meant or, you know, uh, uh, they, they had no idea. And when they heard about, they depended on each other. When the boat hit the iceberg, they were told like the others, don't worry, go back to your berth. Don't worry about it. Until push came to shove and then mass hysteria. Yeah, Lily, you're welcome to unmute yourself too if you want to chime in. Um, but as far as the crew of the Titanic um, and their language skills, most of the crew of the Titanic were from Southampton, um, England, mm -hmm. or um, from places in Ireland. So um, most of the crew members did not speak any of those languages. And, right. and as, as Leila just said, most of the signage is in English, the crew are speaking English, and these passengers were just told to stay put. So there's a nice story of a woman by the name of her name was Samina Samina Tanus Khuri. Her bro, she was coming to join her husband who was already in Wilkesbury. His brother Charles Thomas, whose actual name was Bashir, Bashir was bringing her back. She had her newborn son with her, five five months old. They were coming. The boat sinks. They get the women on the lifeboat. She puts her hands up to get her son. The boat's dropped. Her son, her 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 brother-in-law's holding the baby to put the and the boat dropped. She speaks no English. He speaks English. Mm -hmm. And he sees this first woman there that's going down the boat, take the baby and return him to his mother. The, the woman didn't even know who it was. So she, Samina, because you know, a, a firstborn child, she's going crazy. They she ends up in New York at the hospital and she's screaming, she's going maniacal until. The nurses walk by wondering who this baby in this blue blanket, special blue blanket is. She sees them, okay, done. She never got to thank the American woman. In 1972, somehow or other, news newscasters got together, got the story together, and Thelma Thomas was able to finally meet the woman in California who had saved her son. Yeah. Wow. So she was lucky she had her brother-in-law with her, though. Yeah. Another question was, you mentioned a bell in a museum that honors the five Palestinian young men. Uh, what was the bell for? The bell is in commemoration. They rang the bell for one year every day at, the, at five different schools in Jerusalem to remember the boys that had died. The only thing I know about them that they worked in the olive grove. So I, I have a funny feeling they could be from Yaffa. I, I don't know. Palestinians that I've spoken to, the old timers, heard, have heard of them, but I need the names. Yeah, so I still have my feelers out there, and I know it's confirmed because the uh, Red Cross relief, uh, the, the Red Cross um, relief um, information states in one point that it's hard to get to the Syrian villages. We even have to go as far away as Palestine. So the, the link is there. There's something there, and I'm still trying to find it. And to be honest, I did speak to the gentleman, the curator of the museum there, but you know, there's. Um, censorship from the other side so every time i mentioned the word palestine i was like it was cut off yeah. palestinian yeah that's to be blunt i'm being honest i don't hide things yeah another question for for both of you lily and lila's are you still doing research are and and lily you mentioned you were mm -hmm. lily you're mute lily do you can you unmute So in the top right corner of your picture, Lily, there should be three little dots and there you can hit unmute or at the very bottom of your screen, there should be a mute and unmute where you can click. And um, then another question while we wait for Ms. Lily, was the connection with Michigan State or city? How was that? You talked about, you know, people landing in the US. They where... went to Michigan City. Um, we have three or four passengers that were going there because they had family members there. Again, because the Syrians, traveled to not just for the time the titanic you went somewhere where you knew someone or you knew of someone from the same area mm -hmm. there are a lot of syrians from from the um where southern lebanon is now Bin Shabel and um 
Tibnin that were going to um, Michigan City because there were other people there. I have some victims too as well, Muhammad Nasser, who was supposed to be going there as well. You know, it's sad because a lot of people just don't know what happened after that. I have a first, I forgot to mention, there was an Arabic speaking passenger that traveled first class, but he was the dragoman. If you know what that is, that's like a translator or guide for the Harpers that were in first class. And although um, the Harpers or whoever said that they paid for his ticket, that's not true. He paid for his own ticket. He was um, he was a travel guide in Cairo because a lot of people, like you said, Molly Brown uh, bought something in uh, Cairo, you said, I think, I believe, or a, a, a trinket. A lot of people are going to the Middle East at that time, whether to Palestine, to the holy sites, or to Egypt to see the pyramids and so on. Um, so he traveled first class. He disappears once he reaches New York. His family, for three years, no one knows where he is. And then he shows up out of nowhere after three years back in Egypt. Yeah. And that's the new information I have where what happens to him. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, Roxy says she has some Anderson ancestors in I Iowa and maybe some research needs to be done. So we can maybe help get you connected to Lily. And, Lily, if she unmutes. Yeah. Some help getting some of this research done. I know, poor Lily, we can't get her unmuted. I apologize, Lily, and I apologize, folks, that we can't get Lily unmuted here. <laughs> From our end, we're not able to unmute. Maybe if I rem remove her as co-host. Oh, maybe, yeah. And then try it again. Oh, technology. We always say at the Molly Brown House Museum that- uh... I'm gonna give you one, one a bit of nice information. That woman, Shanini, that I spoke of, that her 95-year-old daughter, who has strong religious, she becomes the basis of the family that begins, I don't know if you've heard of the ice cream company, the Joy Cone Company. That's her company. Yeah, so, we actually uh, mentioned that in one of our um, exhibit pieces about that yeah. family in particular. They're great. And then sort they're, of the legacy that they've left behind. They're very receptive to questions about their mo mother or their grandmother and so on. Yep. Very good family. Yep. Oops. Well, we'll keep, we'll try for another minute to try to get Miss Lily unmuted here. Um, another question, what made you start doing your research on the Titanic and the Syrian passengers? The Syrian passengers? Because there's always been a lacuna. I, I'm, um, as I get older, I speak my, I speak my mind more. Uh, from uh, when I was in university, even before, uh, I found always there's been a lacuna about the Syri uh, Arab history, not just Syrian history, Arab history. And when it is presented, it's presented in the language of the conqueror. So uh, I, I wanted to put out there that, you know, I, I believe we're in a world, I, I guess because I'm from Canada originally and because Canada is a multicultural society and they accept it as a multicultural society or did when I was there under the prime minister Trudeau, the father of the present day, it's a multicultural society that we live under an umbrella of Canadianism. And that's how I feel these countries that are made, like the United States is a young country compared to the rest of like Iran, the Middle East and, and India and so on. It's a young country. So we can accept that there are other people that built this country, um, not just a certain element. People came, my grandparents came both sides and built Canada, built, you know, they were all part of it. The Syrians were part of the history. I wanna make it as part of the United States. When my book, when I first sent out my proposal for the book before it was published, I mean, before it was accepted publication, I tried with the Smithsonian uh, Institute because I felt that the Syrian uh, ethnic ethnicity here in the United States is part of the you know immigration history of the United States and so on. I was told in so many words that it was this, it was this it was just a trivial aspect of the immigration. And so I think that's what incited me more. The more negative, the more positive I became that I wanted to show that there were other people because we do hear about the Molly Browns. We do hear about Isidore Strauss and um, all the famous people who were the celebrities of the time. But those paupers that Lily referred to as paupers and peasants, they all were somebody important in their own families. And they, they were the breadwinners many times. They were the young men that they had put their hope in that didn't survive. I mean, their wives lost their husbands and they're 
why lives changed forever. Adele Nasrallah's family never knew the whole story. Adele Nasrallah's family, her the woman whose husband uh, whose husband's family started Nickelodeon's, his family believed that she had gone mad. That's how she went. She didn't know what to do because her husband, the swell off man who had pampered her, was gone, and she had his child with her. With her. Um, they believed that she had ended up in a sanitarium. When I did my book and I was able to communicate with both sides, that's when they learned that, no, she did not remarry and that she survived. And I found out in 1947, she went back, even though she was married and her husband, her second husband, she loved him. She went back when she was in California for a, a business trip her husband's on. She went to visit the Nostrola family to meet them. I, I thought that was so kind. And her daughter said until the end, she still had feelings for her first husband. You know, 14 years old, I guess first love yeah there are just so many of those amazing stories on yeah the there are i mean every every ethnicity has them i just wanted to make sure the reason i did it uh, the syrians are included too yeah absolutely yeah. well thank you so much lily i'm so sorry we can't figure out how to get you unmuted <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> oh technology we always I say know, Lily roundhouse museum oh technology <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having this presentation, Andrea. I think it's great. As I said to you earlier, this should be done with all the public schools. I mean, kids are fascinated still, not with dinosaurs and not just with dinosaurs and so on, or Marvel. Titanic, it always, I've got grandchildren. I know when you mention the Titanic, oh, you know, I just think it would be great if they all knew. Yeah, we do, school, we do school programs that talk about the Titanic and bring stories like the ones you're telling tonight. Yeah. To, to the classroom so so that people can understand the breadth of the Titanic story yeah. beyond the story of Mrs. Yeah. Brown. We all know the story of Mrs. Brown, like you yeah. said, yeah. you know, but you know, we need to learn about the other people on the ship as as it relates to the larger story of immigration to America and these yeah. families who were torn apart, who made sacrifices. It's it's our story as a country that needs to be shared. It, it is. It is. So, yeah. It is. So uh, some more questions. We do have these books available as if they're available. Uh, we do have some in the in our own museum store. You can also find that on them on Amazon. And I will put. No, them mine mine is sold out on Amazon, and yeah. I asked not for uh, not to be reprinted because um, the new book I'm going to work on. Update. So yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, we will we will keep an eye out for your update. Okay. 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 I will send out an email that helps to answer some of these additional questions, um, and I will also provide a link to this recording so that you can watch it again if you miss something. Um, or if you'd like to just um, sort of see it all again or share it with friends. Um, and again, we're from the Molly Brown House Museum in Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to bring up one more quick little slide. Again, here's some of those immigration records. So like, like our both of our authors said, this is years and years of research in the making. Uh, you have to travel to different archives. Um, and one of these one of the, you know, how we know what we know, we're looking at some of these records um, that were being taken as passengers were coming off the Carpathia, et cetera. Um, our last Deeper Dive series event will be in person rather than virtual. So if you're in Denver, you can join us on September 15th at the Alamo Draft House Cinema in uh, Sloan's Lake, Denver. Um, we are going to do a special screening of the Six. It is a movie, a documentary filmed about the Chinese passengers on the Titanic. There were eight Chinese men on the Titanic, six of whom survived. Um, and of course, at this time in American history, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, mm -hmm. So even though six of them did survive, they were asked to stay on board the Carpathia until they could make their, their connection to another ship that was taking them to South America. So we're going to be doing a live Q&A with filmmaker Steven Schwenkert um, and then watching the film. And this is in partnership with our friends at Colorado Asian Pacific United. They are a local Denver nonprofit organization whose mission is to further the story of um, all Asian Americans in Denver's past and history because uh, um, it's a history that's hand in hand with the growth and, and birth of our city. So we're excited to be able to co-present this uh, film with, with them. Uh, so please again, join us on September 15th. You can find information about different ticket prices all on our website, which is mollybrown.org. 
I'm gonna stop sharing again. Thank you all so much for joining this evening. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lily, so much. Thank you. This was fantastic. Thank, thank you so you. much, all, and have a good evening. You too. So sorry, Lily. <laughs> we'll figure it out. I'll give you a call or an email and we'll try to figure out what happened and allow you a chance to maybe uh, share some more words and thoughts with our group when I send an email out to everyone who participated. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Have a good night, all. Mm -hmm.